Davis, it is my real pleasure to welcome Levi Roach today. Um, Levi, in many ways, needs no introduction, but he's going to get one anyway. Um, he is Associate Professor of medieval, medieval History at the University of Exeter, and he's now the author of three books, she says, which is like, you know, a bit much really, representing his very wide expertise and also his capacity to range from really some very, very specialist topics across multiple languages to also writing for much wider audiences. His books include Kingship and Consent in Anglo-Saxon England, Aphorid the Unready, which was winner of the 2017 Longman History Today Prize, and Forgery and Memory at the End of the First Millennium. He's also writing a history of the Normans for John Murray, which I've read a chapter of, and has also published on law and legal norms, ritual and memory, historiography, feudalism, charters and diplomatics, and apocalyptic thought. So it's a real, real pleasure to introduce Levi and his paper, The Ottonian Chancery, Whence and Whither. Thank you very much, Alice, for that kind introduction. Um, I should probably have warned you earlier, but I'm on a Wi-Fi extender here. Generally, it's pretty reliable, but every now and then, normally at the most awkward moment, kicks out. So just sort of show me um, uh, in your position as chair if, if you're not hearing me or something goes wrong. Um, but I'll say it's, it's really a pleasure to be able to be with you all um, uh, uh, virtually um, as it is. I have very fond memories of attending the IHR earlier Middle Ages seminars myself and the uh, later years of my PhD, including uh, alongside some of the others here uh, this evening. Now, the subject I've chosen isn't exactly the sexiest one, um, and I think I might as well admit this up front. There are some subjects, environmental history, medical history, gender history, that are really um, in at present, and quite rightly so. Ottonian diplomatic is most certainly not one of those subjects. On one level, this is perfectly understandable. Most of the documents have long since been edited, mostly in the 1880s and 1890s. And the attitude, as uh, Mark Mersiowski noted in a slightly different context, um, uh, but of the Carolingian diplomata, has been one of parta edita causa finita. In other words, we have the editions, we have critical editions. Um, the job's done, let's move on to other sorts of work. The problem is that this leaves a very large body of original material from the Etonian period untouched. Uh, a very, very large body indeed. And this becomes a particularly pro particular problem when we go back to the point um, uh, of when these were originally edited in the 1880s and 1890s. They were at the very start of that great uh, uh, monumentous tradition of editing uh, uh, royal charters. And we know that in this early work, the monumentous made errors, even in the later work, but particularly in this early phase. They were working typically from tracings and or hand-drawn facsimiles of these documents. Very rarely did they have the originals in front of them. Um, occasionally they get them sent around. The vast majority they were having to consult in that format and collate in that manner. So it's hardly surprising they made mistakes. In fact, the surprising thing is they didn't make more. And we know some of these errors from subsequent work. For example, uh, Theo Kultzer's work on uh, San Maxima in Trier and the forgeries there. Um, and in my recent work on forgeries, one of the things that really jumped out at me is just how much of this material really is in need of revisiting. Um, and so in that respect, this paper um, and the article that it will become um, around this time next year um, uh, in the Deutsches Archiv is kind of building on that basis. Um, already, in fact, in the 1980s, Carl Richard Brühl was calling for a new edition of the Etonian Wellness, and that's really more urgent uh, now than ever. The subject also matters, however, beyond Ottonian history and that, that particular uh, 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 region I've been focused on more in recent years because, and hopefully now my transitions will work, here we go, yeah, um, uh, because the model of the chancery that we've all inherited directly or indirectly goes back to the work of this chap here, Theodor von Sickel, the, the great founder of modern uh, diplomatic, who developed his theories while editing the Ottonian royal diplomas. So even if you've never touched and never want to touch on Ottonian royal diploma, you have been influenced indirectly by this kind of work. And Sickle famously placed great weight on chancery form as a kind of measure of authenticity for these documents, what he called kanzlei mäßig. So is a document kanzlei gemäß? Is the diploma, does it look like something produced in the chancery? The principle he was applying here, as he illustrated in his picture, was that any hand that was attested producing documents for at least two different recipients should be considered a chancery hand, i.e. the common denominator then is the court not the recipients themselves. And anybody who did this was given a formal designation. In this period, our notaries don't name themselves. 
they're anonymous. So they get given a name after the chancellor under whom they're serving, and then a letter um, according to who is attested first and so on. So you get these wonderful names like Bruno A and Rudolf E, which is a, a very exciting designations. Um, and for Sickle, ultimately, uh, chancery hands were the strongest sign of authenticity. Anything else lay under a slight cloud of doubt because he knew there was authentic recipient platform. The recipient size produced their own documents. Uh, but of course, they could be recipient forged. And it was so much harder to test those mechanisms in terms of this. Now, as should be evident from this even bold summary, Sickles was very much a maximal case for the Chancery. He saw it very much as being a counterpart to the institutions of uh, Prussian and Austrian bureaucracy he knew from the later 19th century. Um, and the suggestion that any hand operating for simply two recipients automatically must be member of a chancery, a formal institution, in royal employ, and so on, um, uh, is obviously one that most of us wouldn't run with. But it has this long legacy because some scribes get chancery designations and some don't. Uh, and that has a knock on effect indirectly for even how a lot of modern scholars still treat this. Now, Sickle's arguments were not entirely unchallenged, have not gone unchallenged, particularly in the 1930s. As traditional constitutional history started to become a split in Germany. Um, Clevitz, famously in the Deutsches Archiv, attacked the concept of chancery. His observation was fundamentally that the term cancellari and Latin is first attested in the 12th and 13th centuries, and that Sickle was therefore guilty of historical anachronism in using this term uh, and using this model, the, the assumption that it was a, a firmly organized institution before it was even named as such. Um, and within one year of that, also in the Deutsches Archiv, then Karl Erdmann uh, uh, aimed his fire at the early years of Henry I, the first of the Ottonian and Rudolphine rulers. And his fundamental point here, he was part of a series of pieces on Henry I, but his fundamental point here was that the uh, chancery of the earliest Ottonian rulers was much more makeshift than Sickle thought. Normally it was just one chap at any given time, maybe two at most. Um, so not really an institution, more of the over there in the corner. Um, perhaps the most sustained criticisms are those dotted throughout the various um, pieces published by uh, Paul Fridolin Kerr, um, Sickle's most gifted student, um, in his volumes that he published alongside his editions of the later Carolingian charters from East Francia, the kind of precursors to the Etonian. So he had to revisit some of those materials. He corrected some of Sickle's <laughs> errors, but he also was pointing out some of the problems of Sickle's assumptions. And made it very clear that he was distancing himself from that ultra institutionalized view. Um, and these various German diplomatists were not on their own. Very similar ideas were circulating, being developed by uh, French diplomatists, particularly most famously Georges Tessier in his book on Saint Denis. Um, and that kind of uh, French Chartiste tradition continues to be very strong, with a very strong focus on the recipient. One of the things that Tessier showed was that diplomas for Saint Denis showed all the classic Sicilian signs of. Cancelli may see, right? But if you looked really closely, you could prove they were produced at Saint Denis itself, in fact, and, and not in some kind of chancery. So there was various um, revisionism, particularly in the 30s and 40s uh, on, on all of these fronts, but large elements of the Sicilian model survived. And this is partly because of the, the subtlety of his original teachings, and it's something that's always overlooked by his critics. Sickle always was aware of recipients and highlighted it very successfully in many cases. And he was aware that most of those documents were authentic. Um, so he was a very agile thinker, even if he was very much a 19th century Prussian um, a scholar. Um, but it's also partly because attention just shifted elsewhere. The diplomas that needed to be edited were those of the late Carolingians, Herr, um, and then those of the Salians and Stauffer, particularly in the latter cases, since there could be no doubt that there was some form of institutionalized rule um, by then. Um, uh, then uh, we've just got upgraded, great, we have extra minutes, I'm just informed. Um, uh, but um, because there could be little doubt uh, that there were more formal institutions there, there was no need to continue tilting at windows. We could kind of leave some of those questions to one side and focus on the charters we were at. Hints of further revisionism can be seen in later work, particularly by uh, Heinrich Fichtenau um, in the 1960s onwards. Um, and then more recently by Peter Rook and Hagen Keller in the 1980s and 1990s, the latter two particularly uh, emphasizing the sort of semiotics uh, uh, of chargers and uh, the non-administrative uh, rules they played. But the only sustained effort to engage with this kind of material really since Sickle and certainly since there has been um, this composing volumes. These 
three points, I'm sure, with all your bedtime table, bedside tables, excellent cure for insomnia, um, uh, by Wolfgang Kushner. Um, these are the published version of his, Habilita his Habilitationsschrift, which came out with the MGH Schriften series in 2003, a very highly regarded series. Now, Kushner set out basically to complete what Kerr and others had started, developing a point that had been made by Fichte, by Fichte now kind of in the 60s in passing. He argued that many, perhaps even most, draftsmen scribes of the Ottonian period, those responsible for producing these diplomas, were in fact leading prelates, in almost all cases leading bishops. The argument was therefore accompanied by a bold series of identification. Um, and typically, any notary who seems to be associated with a bishop or a bishopric or shows kind of local interest was assumed to be that bishop, um, sometimes with paleographical considerations in its favor. But once kind of uh, Kushner establishes his model, which is that that is at fact the norm, he then goes on to make more speculative identification, he acknowledges as such, simply based on career. So this notary is operating at the same time as this bishop is in office, they might be the same. So he throws out a series of further identifications here. He also throughout emphasizes the role of recipients and in particular third parties. And it's the latter point that's the more um, uh, original one. He, he emphasizes the recipient much more than um, Sickle had, but that you know, has been the case with particularly in France for a long time now. Um, but as I say, it's these third parties that is really interesting here because to his mind, there's no real chance, really, at least as a single institution. There are various individuals with varying degrees of connection to court and sometimes each other who produce diplomas. And in terms of this, he breaks them down into five categories that I will be using at times um, in the following. First of all, imperial or trans-regional court notaries. These are the transfer scribes in the traditional sense. Ones who are regularly at court, they produce diplomas throughout almost all parts of the kingdom or recipients from almost all parts of the kingdom. Uh, he uses imperial if they're active north and south of the Alps, but that's just, I don't think that important really. Then he has his next step, regional court notaries. These are active mostly or exclusively when the court is within a region, but then from recipients from throughout the realm. So these seem to be locally based figures, but who kind of become activated when uh, the, the king or emperor rocks up. They show up at court and they produce them for, and they produce them for anyone. Then we have regional recipient notaries. These are figures who produce diplomas only for one region, but potentially from anywhere. In the world. So they seem to be based at one regional house, but kind of produce them not only for their immediate friends, but potentially quite a few people in the area. So it's a different kind of element of regionalization. It's getting closer to recipient production, but it's not recipient production because it's for multiple recipients, quite a few. Then we have true recipient notaries. The classic example of um, notaries producing diplomas only for their own house or closely related houses, the kind of classic example. Style. And then finally, we have occasional notaries, those who produce just one or two documents and they can't, they defy further organizing. You know, that's a kind of catch-all, we don't know. In doing this and making these de designations, um, uh, uh, Hushner was developing consciously or otherwise, he doesn't um, uh, cite it, um, but this piece published in uh, Archive for Diplomatique in the late 70s by uh, Jacques Prusher, um, which was about, amongst other things, uh, uh, charter production by third parties. Um, what, and that's one of the fundamental points that Prusher was trying to make, was actually it's not just you know, recipients and uh, chanceries. What Kushner adds to this though, is a sense of the gradations that isn't there. And is I think new, new important, um, and as we'll see actually works very well. Now the response to Kushner has been generally positive. Um, most reviews have welcomed his revisionism, which sat well, particularly in 2003, with the recent work of people like Gerd Althoff, Hagen Keller and Johannes Fried, who are busy at the time kind of deconstructing Ottonian kingship, cutting the Ottonian rulers down to size. Um, however, they also, in almost all cases, emphasize that these identifications of um, uh, bishops with leading notaries would need further testing before being adopted more widely. A smaller number of voices were more critical. So Brigitta Merta, who certainly knows her way around a charter in the Mitteilungen from Vienna, um, gave it a very extended review which emphasized its importance, but also uh, um, noted a number of inconsistencies in arguments. So she points out that in some cases, Kushner identifies a notary as a bishop because the notary is active producing diplomas at the same time the bishop is in office as bishop. But at other times, he assumes that a notary is a bishop because his notarial activity stops when the bishop is appointed. So in that case, 
he then is too busy being bishop to still be a notary. But of course, under these circumstances, the thesis is almost important, impossible to falsify. If you consider both overlapping offices and notarial activity in favor of an identification and the absence of overlap in favor, um, then you're kind of playing a bit fast and loose here. And I think she's quite right there. She also queried a number of his paleographical identifications. Um, this was purely on the basis of his own plates, um, but she gave some good reasons for doubting some of the more bold ones. So that was the first kind of signs potentially of uh, a warning or uh, 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 criticism. Soon thereafter was published this piece on Cluny and the Atonians by Sebastian Beret. And in this, he doesn't really deal with the main thesis, but he ended up having to confront this uh, uh, came out just as he must have been finishing this. The fact that Hushner argues that amongst other of his identifications that the notary known as Heribert D, very active under Otto III's later years, was Odilo of Cluny, the abbot of Cluny. And he points out that the uh, diplomatic arguments in favor don't really wash. So one of the reasons is that his dating mechanisms are very different from what we see otherwise in Italy or Germany, but they're also completely contrary to what we see at Cluny. So they're, they can't, saying he's Odilo doesn't really help us at all. Um, and he did good, good reasons to doubt there. But the main response was this, a stinging 46 page review article in the Deutsches Archiv by Hartmut Hoffmann, who sought to dismantle the entire paleographical basis of the thesis. According to him, just one of Hushner's identification is paleography, and there are many, um, uh, can be upheld. And according to him, there's no reason to presume that bishop notaries were the norm in the church or even in the church. Um, uh, and indeed, his is a kind of a hyper critical case in many respects. He doubts, um, even when we do have kind of ancillary evidence, that we can make the leap that uh, a notary was the bishop rather than, say, an amanuensis. Uh, so he's just simply very doubtful of how far we can go with any of them. The question this all raises, though, is what to do when you've got these competing opinions uh, um, uh, uh, and this varied reception. Many accept Kushner in full. Um, sometimes they note and respond to criticism in footnotes. I think in the vast majority of cases, they are unaware of it, so, or seemingly unaware of it. So um, you'll see lots of very uh, positive receptions when he's running with his identifications and completely understandably, particularly say, you know, um, uh, 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 for scholars based in Italy working on Italian regional history, they've got no reason to be aware of Hoffman's response or uh, further controversy. Others, a slightly smaller number, but also very significant, cite Kushner, sometimes note possibly or use terms like that in their main text, cite him, but then also kind of give the classic CF Hoffman and or Merta, particularly Hoffman, leaving the question open. So that, that's what uh, Simon McLean very sensibly does, for example, in his recent Ottonian queenship. He's done it elsewhere. Charles West has done this in the Anglophone world. But you see it in, in German scholarship um, as well. Um, uh, uh, and then finally, there's a smaller group, including um, uh, uh, Herbig Wolfram, uh, Tony Scharer, and myself. It's no accident those former two, because they're both colleagues or former colleagues of Brigitte Merta, have expressed rather more serious reservations, typically citing again off or Merta, not going into further detail. The real problem, however, is that nobody's really tested the thesis. So Hoffman's gone into some of the paleography, but not really taken seriously the wider diplomatic points made. Um, and indeed, his criticism is sometimes very uh, uh, worthwhile and important, but often misses the point. And so this is what I've now attempted to do. I've created this rather uh, rough and ready Excel file um, uh, in order to go through uh, the scribes, their identifications, and be able to group them in different ways, um, and look at all of the drafts and scribes um, from the reign of Otto I in doing so. Um, and what I would doing, what follows, distills this. This is um, a, a much shorter version of what is now nearing a 20,000 word article. Um, so there's been a fair bit left on the cutting room floor. Do just shout if you want to hear more, you'll probably regret asking. Um, fundamentally though, to give you just a few of the headliners before we go into the, the, uh, the mind numbing detail, um, Kushner's model, his wider model of different notaries works and works really well. However, his identifications of individuals typically don't. And bishop notaries, therefore, were more common than sickle and older diplomatic thought, but I think not nearly as common as Hushner thinks. Um, but we'll go into uh, um, why in a moment. Before getting into detail, though, it's also worth giving a few brief methodological preliminaries. So central to Hushner's argument is that literacy in this period is limited, and that any notary, therefore, was of elite standing. 
So this wasn't a kind of low level uh, task. That, that, that's the way Sickle described it. He called, called them Unterbeamt, they're the kind of low level civil servants kind of front line. Um, now, this is certainly true so far as it goes, but it doesn't necessarily make them bishops. That, that's quite like, that's rather like saying that, you know, in the 12th century, knights were members of the secular elite, therefore 12th century knights were earls and dukes. You know, some of them were, the vast majority of them weren't. And we know from work on um, uh, paleography in the period, not least by Hoffman himself, but also by others, Natalia Daniel, uh, Katarinetta Bordarve, um, that there were trained scribes and that there were no rarity or shortage of them in the Estonian realms. So we're thinking of, you know, hundreds and thousands of people capable of producing high quality manuscripts who would, you know, technically be fully capable of producing diplomas. And it's impossible that the majority of these figures all became bishops or abbots at some point. It's it simply, the maths doesn't happen. There are a few other niggling problems. So Kushner never really explains how bishops are meant to have seen to their local pastoral duties while producing these diplomas. And in some cases, he's identifying them with the most active scribes of the period, people who must have been at court much of the year. Um, and so how will you square this with, say, the work that someone like Tim Reuter did late on in his career, which emphasized that even the kind of classic courtier bishops of the Etonian period spent most of their time and directed more of their energies towards their bishopric. Um, is something he never really resolved. I think there's a kind of uh, a bit of a hangover of the old Reichskirchen system there. This assumption that bishops would producing diplomas with the uh, the emperor because that that's what they love. They just like like you know to, to be be with him rather than be at their local bishop. Um, so that that's a, a major concern there. A slightly smaller concern, but also a concern there too, is that we have no shortage of episcopal vitae in this period. And having gone through as many of them as I, I could identify. I've been able to find only one case of a diploma of a bishop described producing a diploma. That's in a life that's from the Salian period. It's not strictly contemporary. Um, I've no reason to doubt that one case, Wolfgang of Regensburg, um, but it certainly doesn't suggest it's the norm because we regularly have in bishops' lives references to them receiving privileges from rulers. And almost never is it said that they produce them. In fact, that's the only case where it is. So that's another kind of cause for concern for me there. But ultimately, the proof of the proverbial pudding lies in the eating. And here's where we uh, need to uh, head ad fontes. And this is where it gets a bit technical. So feel free to drift off, get yourself a cup of, open a glass of water, open your bottle of wine or whatever, uh, open a beer. Um, there will at least be some uh, vaguely pretty pictures. Uh, and I hope to come back to some of the wider points towards the end. Now, the greatest advantage, as already kind of noted, of Kushner's model is that it breaks down the old chancery recipient plan. Uh, that we're not dealing with two different things, actually a whole range of options. And I emphasize that most charters, or at least most charter scribes, lie actually somewhere between these points. The exceptions are those who are super active in a court all the time, and those who are really localized. Most people who could produce charters did so for more than one recipient, and on more than one occasion. Um, and in practice, this works really quite well, and particularly Kushner's analyses are very persuasive for the more occasional hands, or the more regional hands, his kind of regional court notaries, um, and his regional recipient notaries. And so those are the ones I want to start with. So a good example of this is a set of Swabian hands in the period, in the 950s and 960s. Um, these are Ludolf B, Ludolf C, and Ludolf E. If you're not used to these designations, you will be by the end of this talk. Um, uh, all active in the 950s and 960s. All were deemed chancery scribes by Sickle because they're active for at least two recipients. But they re reveal a very clear regional profile. So Ludolf B, here you have them, four originals. Two are for Hur, bishopric in Southern Swabia, one for Einsiedel, a monastery in Southern Swabia, and one for Fischbeck in East Valia. So three of four are for Southern Swabian recipients. Ludolf C, six originals. Two for the bishopric of Hur, one for Einsiedel, one for Bishop Hartford of Hur, one for Schwarzach in Alsace, which is a confirmation of an exchange with Bishop Hartford. So five of six there connected in some way with Southern Swabian recipients. And then we have Ludolf E. Two originals, one for Hure, one for Einsiedel. So a very strong distribution here. Um, and even at a superficial glance, it's quite obvious these are not people who are in royal, regular royal. These are not chancery scribes in the sense that Sickle thought of them as somebody who joined the chancery or something like that. These were local Southern Swabian figures. Um, that much is very, very clear. And the common denominator, as um, uh, uh, Hushner notes quite rightly, must be Bishop Hartford. And he's the first person to really notice this. 
um, who had previously been a chaplain of Duke Hermann of Swabia and had overseen the translation of St. Felix and Regula from Zurich to Einsiedeln. So he has a known connection with Einsiedeln. And Einsiedeln and, Cho and the bishopric are the main um, points of Ottonian authority in the region in southern Swabia. So these are uh, centers with whom the rulers are on very close contact. So clearly these are not chance reproduction as mentioned in the traditional sense, but it's also not pure recipient production. They're active not only for their neighbors and friends at Einsiedel, but also fish, you know, because only he's just at court, lends a hand. Um, also, none of these figures are Hartford and Hushner doesn't attempt to identify them as such. I suspect because there's three of them, it's almost too many. If there'd just been one, I suspect he would have made it. Interestingly enough, he doesn't discuss this, but actually we do know Hartford's hand, we have it. Because um, he's almost certainly the scribe who produced a diploma in favor of Hartford when he was a ducal chaplain. Um, and he produces then one later diploma for the bishopric. He doesn't get a chancery designation though because even Sickle could see he was just a recipient there. But the interesting thing here is that even at a Southern Swabian um, bishopric and um, the bishopric of Hur is actually relatively poor. It receives quite a few diplomas because Otto is very interested in it strategically, but it's actually quite poor. Even there, we have a bishop who can produce diplomas himself plus at least three others. So there's no shortage of scribes here. And it's important to bear in mind when we start going elsewhere, where sometimes we just have a, a tentative connection between a bishop and a, a notary, that, that in most places we need to imagine at least three, four people being able to do this kind of work. <clears throat> but already here, we start seeing other problems with um, uh, Hushner's modus operandi. Because he wants to identify as many draftsman scribes with leading prelates as possible, he's inclined to see Ludolf E, the last of these figures, as Abraham of Rising, the Bishop of Rising in these years. Now, Leodolf E is actually never active in favor of Rising, and apparently is most active in favor of Southern Swabian recipients, which will be a very, very odd distribution for an Episcopal notary. E. Hushner speculates that maybe he was trained at Kur or in Southern Swabia, and that, that, that may be the case, and that would explain it. But why is he never active for Rising? And it certainly seems very, very odd. It, it would stand out amongst our, our bishop notaries, our other known bishop notaries. The grounds here, though, are not entirely to be dismissed. They're not quite as nuts as it might seem just from that. So the grounds here are that Sickle, in the original edition for the Monumenta, identified Ludolf E as the scribe of Diploma of Otto I, 279, top of your screen here, in favor of one of Abraham's vassals. I've struck this from the list I gave you on the previous page for reasons I'll come clear in a moment. Emil von Ottenthal, when a sickle student subsequently identified that scribe with the scribe of another diploma, diploma of Otto the first 150 in favor of the bishopric of Osnabrück. Now, the latter one is one of those unusual documents of this period where we have as recognition that this is the person who at the bottom of the diploma after the royal or imperial subscription um, writes a recognition clause in the name of the uh, chancery or those who do it up. Normally that's done in the name of the chancellor, although it's not written by the chancellor. Occasionally we get other names. And when we do, they're often the names of the scribe of the diploma in question. If you want to know more about this, ask me in questions, we've not got space here. But in that case, it's an Abraham Notarius who produces one document earlier, and then the same hand appears in a later diploma for Abraham's own vassal. So this makes a very strong and persuasive case for treating the diploma on the top half of your screen right now as being produced by Bishop Abraham himself or his vassal. Um, and I would agree with that. And if that diploma is produced by Ludolf E, then it would follow that all of his ones would have to be Abraham too, and we just have to at the end of it. However, if we look more closely, it's quite clear, I think, that the hands are different, and Hoffman already noted this. So they use a different prisman. Um, I, how well you can see this will depend on your, how large your screens are here, but their flourishes on their um, elongated forms are quite different. Um, and the key distinction that's really quite consistent is D. So Ludolf E's D almost always has this bit of a descender going beneath the line. In Diploma of Otto, the first 279 and 150, those two ones that I think Abraham produced, we never see that form. We do see the D without the descender under Ludolf E, but the point is we see both and the descender is the norm. We never see the descender with the other ones. And there are further ones, if you, if you really want me to go into detail, I can bring up the 20,000 word text. But fundamentally, Hoffman already expressed real doubts here. He's certainly right. These are two different uh, scribes, Ludolf E, Southern Swabian, Abraham, who produces only three diplomas. So we can get rid of that one for a start. Uh, Abraham is a notary, but actually only ever produces two diplomas, one before he's bishop, we don't know where he's based, maybe even at Osnabrück, and then one as bishop of Christ. 
uh, for his vassal. Uh, exactly the kind of distribution we might expect for an, a bishop, very much like Hartford's distribution. <clears throat> we have another nice regional cluster that Kushner deals very well with around Magdeburg. Now, that Magdeburg, um, uh, uh, so the original monastery of Magdeburg, and then later um, Archbishop was founded there by Otto I, that the local monks and then later canons were responsible for many diplomas in their paper was already clear to Sickle. And he saw them in a relationship with the chancery. Um, but he was aware that it was more complex and the, the chancery operated. Um, <clears throat> if we look at them in more detail, though, it's clear that the vast majority of these are operating for local recipients and primarily for Magdeburg or St. Morris. So Ludolf D, three of four, Ludolf H, six of seven, Ludolf I, five of five. Um, the reason why he got a chancery designation is in later years he produced them for other recipients. So these are all really primarily Magdeburg uh, scribes. And I think Kushner is right to emphasize that more strongly. These aren't, you know, people who sit somewhere between a chancery and Magdeburg. These are local Magdeburg figures who occasionally, when the king's in the neighborhood visiting his favorite monastery, they, you know, tag along with court, or when he's at Magdeburg itself, they produce stuff. So they're very much like the Swabian group, but like that, they do produce some documents for other recipients. They're not pure recipient scribes um, either. And indeed, using um, uh, uh, Kushner's own methodology, um, we can actually identify one other likely Magdeburg uh, scribe here. And I think this is, and um, there's some interesting things to be done with uh, taking his points further in terms of things like this. So Bruno C, largely active in the 940s, his, his diplomas don't show as strong uh, 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 a regional distribution as those earlier ones I just showed you a second ago, but is there if we look closely. So two of his ones are for recipients from East Phalia, from East Saxony, where Magdeburg is based, and one is for Magdeburg itself. Three are produced within Eastern Saxony, within that region, and two in the Rhine Main, and particularly those latter two. So when he's active outside of Magdeburg's remit, he's only active for Bishop Anno of Worms, that may not ring any bells here, but Bishop Anno was the first abbot of St. Morris. So the only person outside that he produces for that and for the monastery of St. Morris itself. So actually, when he's, whenever he's outside of Eastern Saxony, it's only on the business of Magdeburg. That's quite clear. So already on this basis, one might actually infer a regional uh, 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 interest. And in fact, if we look more closely um, uh, uh, and build on the work particularly here of um, uh, Schlesinger and Boymann, um, there's good reason to believe Bruno C was in fact a Magdeburg forger. Four forgeries for Magdeburg are almost certainly his work as well. And forgers typically work for their own house. I mean, occasionally we get itinerant ones, but um, uh, this nicely anchors him in, in Magdeburg. So I think we can add him to the list. And if we want to play this game further, um, uh, we can identify a probable Kvedlinburg draftsman scribe in Bruno G, um, a potentially one of the canonesses. Um, Stengel thought it was one of the priests because they have to have priests at Fedlinburg as well so they can celebrate mass, but um, I, I, I'm more inclined to suggest it's actually just one of the local canonesses um, in terms of that. So we can also extend Kushner's points elsewhere. So the fundamental point here is his model doesn't just work for what he's talking about, it can be replicated, uh, very helpful. However, even with these Magdeburg ones, we see some of the problems we saw already coming in with the Southern Swabian group in that he not only identifies these notaries as having local interests, but he also wants to identify them with known figures wherever possible. So in his hands, for example, Ludolf H becomes Adelbert, the first Archbishop, Archbishop of Magdeburg. Um, uh, and his basis for this is that an Adelbert is named as the scribe of a perial charter for San Maxima, which is where we know the future Archbishop was based um, uh, earlier in his career in 959. And Kushner identifies this hand with that of Ludolf H. Now, as previously with um, uh, the uh, Abraham of Rising one, if the paleography works, there'd be no objection to this, particularly in this case, where there's a nice strong later uh, regional focus on St. Morris. However, the paleography, again, doesn't really work. So for a start, different chrismons, that could be private charter versus imperial diploma. But more crucial are other differences. So the G's are completely different. So in the lower document there, I, I have the wrong inscription there. That's kept over from Einzeel. And that should be Heidelberger de uh, Urkunden 323. That's the San Maxima grant from 959. From, uh, 959. His G's always take this dramatic turn to the right. We never see that with Ludolf H. And we have lots of his, we have enough of his work to judge that pretty well. Um, the aspect there is also quite different, a very upright uh, one there. 
I believe I saw Colleen here earlier, so she should be pleased with all these Gs. Um, we have uh, different abbreviation symbols, fundamentally. So um, Rudolf H always uses that one you see up at the top, um, uh, which is kind of based loosely on the ampersand. The other one uses this kind of, you know, half of a bow shape, um, as it were. So they use completely different abbreviation signs too. Um, and one could go through further uh, uh, differences. There can be no questions of hand identity here. Um, certainly not anything we could base any wider theses on. So if that bottom scribe is the future bishop, Archbishop of Magdeburg, he may well be, he's certainly not Ludolf H. Um, uh, so we can kind of put that one uh, to rest. Um, uh, Hushner's identification, he also wants to see Ludolf I. We go back to my list um, here. He wants to see Ludolf I as the later Archbishop Wieselherr. His case is somewhat stronger there, but largely circumstantial. There's no paleographical evidence. And it hinges on the question of forgery. He thinks that Ludolf I's early diplomas, all these five, for example, are forgeries of later years. In some cases, I think he's certainly right, but I'm not entirely sure he's right in all. The, the entire question of forgery of Magdeburg and Ludolf I needs a complete agreement. So I have some niggling doubt. If he's right, then he might be Giselhair. Um, I don't, don't think it's proven even then. Um, it was previously suggested that Giselhair was the local schoolmaster um, Ottrick. And that, that identification is at least equally possible. So, as we've hopefully seen, Kushner's work elucidates local context really, really well. But the identifications themselves um, rarely work in these cases. I think it's only fair to note, however, at least one, one notable exception. So he's inclined to see this chap known as Popo A, active largely in the 930s, as Chancellor Popo who goes on to become Bishop of Würzburg in the early 940s. Now, there's no paleographical evidence here either, but Popo A disappears the very moment that the Chancellor retires and becomes Bishop, and he reappears only once, uniquely, in a diploma in which Popo himself reappears as Chancellor in the recognition clause. So the one time Popo's back at court in his old job, as it were, after being appointed, is the one time this scribe Popo A appears. This suggests a very strong connection between uh, notary and bishop. And on that basis, I think it's, it's only fair to run with Kushner. It's not proven, um, but it remains the most plausible explanation. And indeed, it actually explains Popo's career quite nicely, because the largely East Valian, East Saxon, that is, focus of his um, uh, uh, diplomas that he produces makes good sense in terms of Popo's own background, because we have re reason to believe that he was a Babenberg, and his family and kin were therefore all but eradicated in the early 10th century. They were originally from Franconia, but they were all but eradicated by the Conradines. And their main allies in their feud with the Conradines were the Ludolfing Dukes of Saxon, precisely where he then might have gone to search, seek out uh, Patrick. Um, so in fact, the fact that he's not from Saxony doesn't stand against it, it stands in its favor. So um, I'm actually quite comfortable with the Popo identification. I don't think we can be 100% sure, but it, it's our best explanation to date of his operation. Um, Hushner's arguments, however, struggle more when we get into the most active draftsman scribes here, and we haven't even really scratched their surface yet, so I'm going to give you a few ones here. So in these cases, despite often relatively few signs of local or regional interest, Hushner remains determined to identify as many as possible with leading bishops. And thus, for example, uh, Villigus B, the most active draftsman scribe during uh, Villigus' time as Chancellor, and Villigus goes on to be Archbishop of Mainz, is no one other than the future Archbishop himself. And he's one of those ones where the career as notary ends when the Archbishop is appointed, where that, that's the relation to the mind. The key evidence here, he's paleographically, is Villigus' possibly autographed subscription to the much later Synod of 1007, which sees the foundation of Bamberg Cathedral. I've given that as a thought there. Now I say possibly, the main scribe of the uh, charter here, and it's uh, the act of the um, synod, but written in charter and diploma format. The main scribe is not written Villigus subscription. And so there's a good chance it's autographed, but it's not 100% certain. It is conceivable that is an amanuensis. But if it is Villigus, then we have a nice example of his writing, and it quite possibly is. And then we have, of course, many, many, many diplomas by Villigus B, huge numbers. So we've got plenty to compare. The problem here is that we're over 20 years adrift. So knowing how much allowance one can make for development of the hand and whatnot else is very difficult to say with confidence. But what stand out are the differences, not the similarities. So for example, the Gs are entirely different. 
uh, Vimigus bees ones tend to be very upright with a very small eye in terms of the, the loop going down. And then these characteristic long, very straight descenders. Villigus is in the top, but that's villigus, is nice and loopy and fluid. So the G's couldn't be much more different. Um, hopefully, I don't seem to want to go into my next transitions here, um, probably because I've been playing around with where my, yeah, sorry, I had to move where um, uh, some of my Zoom things were so that I could actually see, see the calligraphical points I was making. Um, his E's are different. So villiguses are much more angular um, and um, have a very small eye um, and seem to be quite horizontal, whereas uh, villigus bays ones tend to be diagonally pointed upwards. Also a small eye, but much less angular. So the E's are really quite different. We could zoom in there um, uh, and you'd see it more clearly, but the E's really are very, very different. And then villiguses R's. Um, in the top example, interestingly, regularly are uh, piercing the crossbar there. Um, that's very much not the case with Villigas um, B, whose R's sit relatively low, have a long descender, are quite smooth. Um, so if the top is Villigas, then Villigas B probably isn't. I, I wouldn't say in this case we can be so confident because there's been a lot of water under the proverbial bridge, but it certainly isn't enough to um, uh, secure the identification. And indeed, Villigas B is never active in favor of mites at all. So there doesn't seem to be any a priori reason other than he's active under Villigas the Chancellor that he should be Villigas, which I think really should be our starting point. You should have evidence in favor of identification rather than saying, you know, how can you disagree with that? And here the older identification comes into play. So older scholarship, particularly Steng uh, uh, Stengel, thought that uh, Villigas B was probably the schoolmaster of Aschaffenberg, Herwart. Herbard appears in private charters of Villigas as, and he's named an imperial notary, the notary of Otto I. So we know from those that he's somebody who's known locally to have produced imperial diplomata. Moreover, a connection with Aschaffenburg explains why Villigas B produces all of the diplomas for Aschaffenburg, except for the one occasion um, in 975, when we happen to know that Herbard is in Rome, dealing with an internal disagreement um, in Aschaffenburg. It would also explain Villigas B's unusually southern orientation. So purely statistically, he produces far more diplomas for Swabia and Bavaria than we'd expect. But Aschaffenburg had been founded by Duke Ludolf and his wife, Ita. Ludolf is the son of Otto I. Um, and it was completed by their son, Otto of Swabia, who is Duke of Swabia and briefly also Duke of Bavaria. So a southern orientation for uh, a, a, a canonical house that's otherwise based in the province of Mainz makes perfect sense with Herbard. There's no explanation if it's Billy really why that would be the case. Uh, so I, I tend to think that that actually older identification remains our best bet. Not 100% not secure, but about as secure as Popo A being Popo, uh, about as secure as we're going to get. Likewise, um, Hushner wants to argue that Bruno A, who's the leading notary of the 950s under Bruno of Cologne's time as chancellor, for non Antonius here, Bruno is the brother of Otto I, who later becomes Archbishop of Cologne. He wants to see Bruno A as Bruno himself. Um, so those two are the same person. And he sees the key evidence here being an addition at the bottom of a local private charter from Cologne. And that's at the top there. I've given it you in two lines. It's originally a single line of text. like um, And this addition is in Bruno's own voice. Now, that alone is no evidence, no secure evidence that it's an autograph of course, because plenty of things can be in someone's voice without being their autograph. But again, the script, if we look at it, is looking quite different. Gs are really quite different. Um, the uh, Xs are, are quite distinct. So X in the top case goes regularly below the script line, never does with BA. And BA we know very, very well. We have over 30 originals. Um, and then, sorry, I've been moving things around again here. Um, uh, and then we also have really quite different uh, abbreviation signs. So, I think that one again, paleographically, if the top one's Bruno, we don't know, but then the bottom one definitely is. So there's no particular reason paleographically to identify the two. But there are important points of contact in this case. So their careers not only overlap nicely, Bruno A is mostly active when Bruno's chancellor, but he's especially active for Lotharingia and Frisia, and Bruno had been educated at the Bishop of Utrecht. So that would make good sense. But we know from his formulation that he's also acquainted with Otto the first, first diploma for Credlinburg. So he's a acquainted also with Eastern Saxon diplomats and very close to the Etonian royal family. So he's clearly an associate of the archbishops. 
Um, but I still think this is actually not proof of identity. And we have a contemporary life of Bruno that never mentions him losing diplomas and mentions him receiving them. So, so there, there, there's some real reasons for problems there. And indeed, there's good reason to believe that he's the otherwise obscure Hoholt, who appears twice as recognition to his acts, uniquely in the place of Bruno. So again, this is a name we wouldn't expect for a second chance, so we get Hoholt. We don't know who the hell he is. Our best bet is, in fact, that he's an OA naming himself. So another one, as it were, bites the proverbial dust. Our verdict sadly can be little more positive positive on the identification of Luke Prand of Cremona with Ludolf F, another very, very active scribe in his case of the later 950s and early 960s. So this is largely for Hushner a matter of contextual arguments based on overlapping careers. The problem here being that we know next to nothing in terms of secure dates of uh, Luke Prand's uh, career. So uh, it, we can't, you know, falsify it, but it doesn't really, it doesn't really say much. He seeks to secure this by comparison of what we suspect is Luke Prand's autograph, of the antipodosis. So this is the hand known as F2 or the corrector who corrects the main manuscript and then adds some bits to it, which Paolo Chiesa has argued, I think quite persuasively restated it like criticism is Luke Prand's autograph. Um, uh, that bit, for example, your bottom example is LF. Um, and again, G couldn't be much more different. Luke Prand's is nice um, uh, 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 and fairly fluid. Um, uh, Ludol F takes that turn to the right that some of the charter scribes ones do. Um, R, this isn't a very good example for Luke Prand, but Luke Prand's R is not infrequently travel above the script line and are often ligatures. That's classic Italian. We never see that in Ludolf F. Ludolf F's uh, script is classically um, uh, 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 north of the Alps, is, trans is classically ultramontane. Um, uh, and finally, um, uh, Luke Prand's X has a dot at the bottom left corner. And it often travels below the script line. In that case, it doesn't, but it often does. Trust me. Again, we don't really ever see this with you all there. So the paleography um, doesn't work. But also in this case, we can apply other criteria. Style. Luke Prand has a very distinctive prose style, full of Graicisms and hyperbole. We see none of this in Ludolf F. And this matters because when we see other literary figures produce diplomas, like Atto of Vercelli, who um, Giacomo Vignodelli has produced a very convincing argument, I think was draftsman, not the scribe. The draftsman, I use the, the underlying Latin text of a diploma of uh, uh, Hugh, um, uh, uh, for Hugh and Lothar for um, Canons of Vercelli. When we have Atto's one, when we have the diplomas um, that uh, Rater uh, drafted for Verona, already identified by Sickel, or Leo later for Vercelli, these stand out because of their kind of uh, verbal pyrotechnics. They go well above the average for uh, normal chances, but Ludolf F in comparison is very mundane and desperate. And if Luke Prand is anything, he is not mundane and desperate. Um, so I think we can safely park, um, uh, uh, very safely park Ludolf F and Luke Prand. And indeed, Ludolf F often seems to show some signs of lower German forms. So he spells Kvedlinburg Fittelingaberg, the T. And uh, the Chancellor Ludolf, he normally spells as a Leupold with a T, classically a lower German uh, form. So um, I think we need to be looking north of German. Uh, so the verdict is not looking great here. It's important also now to emphasize, though, as I did with Popo, that not all of his efforts fail. So his identification of Hubert of Parma with Italian B, one of the more active Italian scribes of Otto's um, reign, is compelling. Pace Hoffman. Hoffman mischaracterizes the evidence, even the ones he has as his um, uh, plates to his response there. Um, so um, and Antonio, Antonella Gignoli subsequently looked in more detail and made it very, very convincing, um, all but certain that Hubert is Italian B. So we do have at least one of these cases that works quite nicely. However, Italian B is much less active than someone like Bruno A or Rudolf F. He's only a leading and a trans regional notary in a much more restricted sense of the term. So we're talking about, about 15 kind of to 20 diplomas, not 30 plus. Um, there's also a clear element of local interest here. Italian B's first diploma is for Hubert and is incredibly generous. So there's good reason to suspect he'd be Hubert. We can see Hubert's interest shining through these diplomas. And finally, it needs to be emphasized, Italy is different. We do have bishop notaries much better attested much earlier for Italy. So Episcopal involvement seems to have been more common. Not the norm there, even there, I think. I think Kushner overplays it, but it is much more common. Um, so uh, it's hardly surprising that we might see it in Italian B. And indeed, the one other identification of his that clearly holds water is of the rather less active Italian D with Ambrosius 
case of Bergamo. This is the one case that not even Hoffman could disagree with. He said, actually, that really does look like the same script. But important caveat, like Popo and some of our other examples, Italian D is active as a draftsman scribe exclusively before Ambrosius becomes Bishop of Bergamo. So yes, he is a notary, and yes, he is a bishop, but he's never a bishop and a notary at the same time. Um, it, it's a different matter. Now, I could easily keep going, but you'll be relieved to hear that I shall not. Uh, the result would be the same. We could extend this into more examples, into the reigns of Otto II, Otto III, Henry II, um, and I would just bore you all. So where does this leave us? Well, bishops were clearly more active than Sickle and Kerr once thought. They were producing a diploma was not a low skill job, and bishops sometimes did this. But there's no compelling evidence, as far as I'm concerned, that they were central to the diploma production in these days. The clear cases, the really well-established ones, all display a marked regional quality, and typically as bishops only produce for their own bishopric and maybe their immediate admirer. Uh, and are never producing large volumes of diplomas. Hubert's are partial exception, but only partial there. This is also the story told by notarial subscription, those other odd figures who occasionally appear um, in the recognition clauses. They don't from Otto II's reign onwards, but under Otto I, every now and then we get weird names we don't expect. And we have good reason to suspect those are normally the names of the scribes. When we match the names we see to the names of bishops, none of them are bishops, and only a small number are people who go on to be bishops. A small number are, so that's how we spot Abraham. Um, uh, and we should, if anything, expect bishops to be overrepresented so we know more about their future careers. So, so, so if anything, it'll be, it's easier for us to identify bishops in the record. We have more evidence of their handwriting and other things like that. And here, one of the problems is that throughout the book, and those who read it will be aware of this, um, Hushner, I think, slightly muddies the water because he regularly talks of how the norm for notaries was that they were bishops in post and prospect. When in German, amtierende und künftige Bischöfe. The problem is, as Merta already noted in a review, these are two very different things. One is a bishop producing a tartar. No one is a future bishop. No one produces a diploma as a future bishop. You're either a bishop or you aren't, or you're hoping to become one. Um, uh, and he's much more successful at identifying future bishops, i.e. people who may have used notarial service as a means to promote them, but then largely drop off the radar or entirely drop off the radar, which in fact is what we'd expect, I think. Um, and nicely explains how they saw to their pastoral duties, that they, they stopped serving. So clearly scribal service was a means to promote. Clearly scribes could become bishops and not infrequently. But this doesn't mean that all notaries were necessarily earmarked for promotion, nor that all that might have once been achieved this. Just because you're hoping to become bishop someday doesn't mean you will, um, as Gerald of Wales demonstrates. Even chancellors did not always make the leap to bishop in, in, under Otto I at least. Um, at least one of his uh, chancellors, Lutger, has never made uh, bishop. And normally when they are made bishop, they cease being chancellor. So why should we expect any more of the scribe? And we know that, thankfully, the chancellor's name is quite high. So finally, I come to conclude with some uh, wider points here then. Where does this leave us with the chancery, Othonian, or otherwise? Well, I think Kushner himself is probably right to avoid the term. His term, he prefers the term court, court notaries, regional court notaries, et cetera, I think is probably more helpful um, in terms of that, that it emphasizes a degree of association with the court, but not their membership of an institution, as it were. He's also fundamentally right in his model. And this is where I'm hoping long run that this um, a paper and eventually the article will be actually a, be a media between Hoffman, who has no truck with any of Kushner's other things, uh, and full ad adoption of them. Because his model really, really works. It's a great model. I, I, I would never have thought of it. it it's absolutely brilliant. Um, we're dealing with sliding scale, different kinds of notaries. It works incredibly well. But as with all good revisionism, Kushner takes it too far. There is a strongly ele centralized element in diploma production. Most of those leading notaries, the vast, vast majority, almost certainly are not bishops, are people regularly at court, people who may well be hoping to become bishops and may well often have become bishops, but aren't bishops while doing it. So we do have a strong centralized element. And this comes out really strongly if we compare Atonian diplomas with their French counterparts. They're much more standard. They're not as standard as their Carolingian predecessors, but they're still pretty standard. So even the recipients are marching to the tune, broadly speaking, of the court. The situation would doubtless also look different if we had more diplomas for laymen. Um, so Nick Vincent in his recent edition of the Charters of Henry II and his kind of preparatory articles has emphasized that we see the activities of the uh, Angevin Chancery most clearly in activity for lay recipients because ecclesiastical houses often are capable of producing their own charters. Well, we only have 35 diplomas of Otto I for laymen, but of those 30, 
are figures we could confidently identify as what uh, Hush and White called court scribes. Of the remaining five, two are figures who would like to become not court notaries. Two are people like Abraham, he's one of those ones, who seem to be local bishops helping out a mate. And one is of suspect uh, quality, I suspect is not actually authentic. That's good. So the vast majority of those, in fact, look very chancery. And so how much more developed things would look if we had more of these um, uh, lay documents, more lay archives surviving is one of those Rumsfeldian known unknowns. So the Antonian Chancery was clearly not run from a box under the bed to borrow uh, Vivian Galbraith's oft quoted dictum. And this I think also does have, but I won't go into this, wider implications for Antonian kingship. Judged by charters alone, a very important fact. Both Altoffs and Freed's and Keller's original kind of deconstructions of Etonian kingship and David Backraft's more recent reinstatement of it are overstated. We're dealing with something between the two, uh, a rather ad hoc system, but with a clear central element. And precisely because diplomas survive so well, they in fact provide a unique window into kingship and into these things. Or as Mark Marasiowski said at the end of his great article on the diplomas of uh, Arnold of uh, Carinthia, Carta Edita causa aperta. And with that, I'm open to questions.